Words cannot describe how much I love El Labyrinto del Fauno, or Pan's Labyrinth. Many people consider Guillermo del Toro's finest work, and it's easy to see why. Everything about it is beautiful. The direction is beautiful. The costume design is beautiful. The set design is beautiful. The acting is beautiful. The story, the characters that make me cry every time I watch this masterpiece of cinema. And if I was just doing a straight review, that'd probably be it. That'd be the review. It's just so good. Now, if I wanted to, I could break down the movie's detailed visual parallels. Or the storytelling that's at once whimsical and haunting. I could dissect the pale man's design and how it invokes the most brutal aspects of fascism, which someone's actually already done, and the link will be up there for you to click on. I could gush about the poetry written into the narration, and the subtle hints of motivation in the dialogue. Bienvenidos. I could talk about how Captain Vidal's entire character arc is played out almost entirely with visuals, complemented by only four lines of dialogue, and yet it's still so powerful and compelling. But in this video, I instead want to talk about hands. No, not that guy's hands. Ophelia's hands. And how they tie into the theme of disobedience. So before I dig in, let's take a quick refresher of the movie. Pan's Labyrinth starts in 1944 Phalangist Spain, with Ophelia and her pregnant mother being driven to a military encampment in the middle of a remote village. Her mother was a widow, but has remarried to Captain Vidal. Es la otra mano, Ophelia. He's not a very nice man. In the night, though, Ophelia meets a stick bug that turns out to be a fairy. It leads her to the middle of a ruined labyrinth nearby, where she meets a fawn who tells her she's the long-lost princess of the underworld. To reclaim her title, she needs to complete three magical tasks, as dictated in the magical Book of the Crossroads given to her by the fawn. As all this goes on, the housekeeper Mercedes and the barracks doctor, Dr. Ferrero, secretly aid the Republican guerrillas still fighting in the woods above the old mill. And at the same time, Ophelia's mother's pregnancy is not going well. Vidal's selfish demand that she be brought to him has caused enormous stress on her. She's coming closer to delivery, the rebels in the forest are running out of men and supplies, and Ophelia needs to finish the three tasks before the moon waxes to its full phase. That's basically the first half of the movie, and it's enthralling. The second part is where things go from perfect to, um, uh, perfecter, uh, more perfect, um, get even better. Ophelia's first task is to go feed magic stones to a toad under a tree. It sits among the roots, feasting on bugs and killing the tree. So Ophelia manages to trick it, and... <laughs> Okay, cut the effect seems some slack here. It was 2006, and I imagine a lot of money went to this. In the process, though, Ophelia ruins her new dress, earning a scolding from her mother. And here, we see the theme of disobedience starting to really stir. If you've seen that Nerdwriter video floating around on YouTube, you know that disobedience is a major theme of Pan's Labyrinth. But what does that really mean? Well, Pan's Labyrinth posits the idea that disobedience is a virtue in itself. This is laid out in a concrete sense in the struggle between the fascist troops and the rebels, as they play an elaborate cat and mouse game. By definition, the rebels are not obeying the government, and the movie frames them as heroes for their continued defiance. Throughout the movie, we never see one of the rebels accept an order from each other. When Dr. Ferrero has to amputate a leg, we get this moment. Un momento, doctor. Un momento. He doesn't cut until the soldier wishes it. And this is thrown into further contrast when one of them is captured, a man with a stutter. Vidal cruelly teases him to follow his orders to count to three. Si cuentas hasta tres, sin tatar, tamudear. As you can see, disobedience is not without consequence, 
in their world as it is in ours. Ophelia learns this the hard way when the second task takes her into the lair of the Pale Man, the living embodiment of fascism, with imagery evoking the horrors of the Nazi regime. It's a terrible place where she's instructed to eat absolutely nothing from the table. The fairies guide her to the item she is to retrieve, but she chooses a different door and finds what she's looking for. Then on her way out, she stops by the table, and having missed supper, she yearns for a single grape from the Pale Man's Feast. The beast springs to life, killing two of the fairies, and Ophelia barely escapes with her life. For this failure, the fawn condemns her, informing her she has failed her task and forfeited her birthright. And it only gets worse. She had been granted a mandrake, a root that, when fed with milk and two drops of blood, would improve her mother's condition. And it works, until her very non-Catholic practice is found by her exceedingly Catholic phalangist stepfather. He demands that it be disposed of. And when Ophelia's mother obeys, The baby survives, Ophelia's mother does not, and it casts further gloom over Ophelia's future. But a glimmer of hope. The fawn returns to her and offers her another chance to prove her worth. Prometéis obedecerme. Haréis todo lo que yo os diga, sin cuestionarlo. Es vuestra última oportunidad. Entonces, escuchadme bien. So in the middle of the night, she drugs her stepfather and then steals away her brother to bring him into the labyrinth. The captain gives pursuit as the rebels begin to launch an all-out assault to take the compound. Deep inside the labyrinth, the fawn meets Ophelia to complete the final task. The portal to the underworld will open, allowing her to enter and reclaim her throne. All it requires is a single drop of innocent blood to be drawn from her brother, but she refuses. The fawn demands she follow her promise to obey him. She still refuses, and so he disappears, leaving her in the clutches of the captain. No! The rebels arrive at the labyrinth. But while they deliver justice to Vidal, it's too late to save Ophelia. She slowly dies in Mercedes' arms, her hand dangling over the edge of the portal, and her blood drips down into the opening below. And that's when she hears her father's voice calling to her from far away. <laughs> Esa era la última prueba, la más importante. Her disobedience has won the day and proved her worthy to be a princess. She is reunited with her family. The fairies killed by the Pale Man have been restored. After everything, she finally returns to her home. Now, were you watching closely? Because you've seen everything you need to piece this puzzle together. When Ophelia first meets Captain Vidal, they share this exchange. Es la otra mano, Ophelia. Did he catch that? For one, it's a David Copperfield reference, sure. But more importantly, it draws our attention to the fact that Ophelia offers her left hand. Throughout history, left-handedness has been frowned upon and repressed in cultures as varied as Japan, India, the Soviet Union, Britain, and yes, fascist Spain. It further underscores how she is a non-conformer. So she uses her left hand when she disobeys, right? Well, not exactly. When she drugs the captain's drink, she uses her right hand to do it. And she uses her left hand to obediently feed the stones to the toad. And her right hand to disobey the fairies and choose another door. Well, maybe she uses her left hand when she interacts with something magical? No, not quite either. She opens the book and passes her right hand across it to summon the words. Well, let's look at when she does use her left hand. 
We have her greeting the captain, establishing it as an important element. Then she feeds the stones to the moribund toad. Then she bites the thumb of her left hand to feed the mandrake. And then she hangs her left hand over the opening of the portal, her blood falling inside. Aside from the establishing use, Ophelia's left hand seems to be used to successfully complete the magical tasks. But there is one more moment when she uses her left hand to take the grapes from the pale man's feast. Which then raises a question I want you to consider. In this tale, where disobedience and breaking the rules is a virtue, a virtue that is explicitly stated to us, ¿Por qué no me obedeció? Es que... Obedecer por obedecer. Así, sin pensarlo. Eso solo lo hacen gentes como usted, Capitán. What if Ophelia was supposed to eat from his table? Suddenly, the three relatively straightforward tasks become an elaborate game of three-dimensional chess. In the first task, Ophelia disobeys her mother by ruining her dress, but she's still following the command from the Book of the Crossroads. Then there's a second task, which she's told is to retrieve an item, but that retrieval is actually a red herring. The actual point of the task is to take the smallest scrap of food from the pale man's table. And I've seen people comment that the musical cues and acting suggest that she's bewitched in this moment. Honestly, I could see that being the case. The real desired effect is to harshly reprimand her because she broke the rules. Then later on, Ophelia is eventually approached again by the fawn and offered one last chance and told to bring her brother to the labyrinth. Her obedience is again demanded. And with everything I mentioned in context, we come to this moment now. In Ophelia's mind, everything is pushing for her to obediently hand over her brother. She successfully completed one task, she can't let that effort go to waste, almost like a sunk cost fallacy. She bungled the second task, so her credibility is hanging by a thread. The fawn is furious again. This is already her second chance and there will not be a third. Her kingdom lies within reach. Her murderous stepfather storms through the maze behind her. All she needs to do to fix everything is to consent to drawing the tiniest bit of blood from her baby brother. Nothing that would seriously hurt him, one single drop. And still, she says no. Ophelia says it herself, she would renounce her sacred rights, her throne, for an infant that she barely knows yet. And that's exactly how she proves that she deserves to have them restored to her. In the face of overwhelming odds, she is strong enough and righteous enough to disobey. A theme made stronger thanks to this subtle visual cue. Another layer of depth to a beautiful and powerful work of art.